Okay, so once again, my name is Tim Shelton. Um, we are here to talk about IB and AIX, and I may spend half my presentation just trying to convince you that people we'll still run AIX. So, uh, <laughs> uh, once again, uh, like I said, um, I work for Intel Hawker Defense. Uh, we're a SIM company here in Dallas. Uh, we've been around since 2006. I'm actually the CTO. Um, the side note pitch is I'm actually the one that wrote all the patents and all the algorithms and all the code for the engine and all the stuff. So I'd be the guy to talk to you for some stuff. Um, a little bit else, uh, other things about me prior to the, uh, apart from the sim stuff, uh, why initially uh, some of the buzz things that I've worked on is Adobe JV2. Everyone remember that one from 2009, the, the beginning of Adobe's fall to you know, peril, I guess. Um, Worked on that with uh, myself and uh, Russell Sanford, Exhort. Uh, so once again, I'm actually Red Sand. I'm with a group called Black Security. Um, a lot of people have, have, haven't heard of us, but a few people have. Uh, we were actually in FRAC, surprisingly. Um, so FRAC and some of the other things. Also, um, I've done some stuff like the, the VNC authentication bypass uh, client. I'm sure a lot of us have used in Pentest if you're not using Metasploit or one of the built-in stuff. It's the single client. All right, I'm done plugging myself. I'm sure you guys are glad. All right, so once again, I'm telling you, I'm gonna spend half my time convincing you that people still run AIX. Um, every, so I've done this presentation three times so far, and every time uh, after wearing the speaker badge, people ask me, oh, what are you talking about? Is it SCADA? Is it a, you know, a, a client-side attack? Is it you know, something with Java? But no, it's you know, an OS attack against AIX. And I go, oh. No, nobody runs that. And I'm like, oh, that's true, I guess. And so I kind of go back and have to try and convince them. But then the other side of that is there are people that will show up and won't give me their first or last name. But they're very concerned that, you know, we're doing research around AIX. So the, it seems like, and we're going to talk about that more, it seems like the momentum shifts towards if you were an entity prior to the existence of computers, you're probably on some sort of IBM platform. And AIX just so happens to be one of the popular ones. And it's cheap compared to HPUX. And I'm going to put that in quotes because that was really cheap. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the mission critical applications AIX uh, may or may not be supporting in your environment. Or again, uh, we're also going to talk about two different methodologies. So um, actually, I kind of want to back up a little bit. I want to better understand. So every time I do these types of talks, I mean, we're actually talking about uh, exploitation research. You know, how things work in memory, corrupting specific pieces of data to take control of other pieces of data to take control to flow of execution. Um, and sometimes I've, I've found that I lose my, uh, my audience in a sense that if you haven't done a lot of uh, exploit research, then this is going to be, this is not going to be a topic for you. I mean, so, you know, when we talk about exploit research, uh, when I was a new, when I started, you know, I started with stack overflows and and then I started with people flows, and then I moved to Windows, and I started doing things around there. Well, we're going to be talking about a uh, non-Intel processor, so we're talking about PPC, which means it's risk, which means it's in a whole other world of uh, things that we have to deal with as far as shell code goes. Um, additionally, uh, uh, additionally uh, with AIX, uh, we find that they're one of the premier, um, one of the pioneers in a sense of the, the post-6 Unix world, you know, coming from the 80s and 90s and, and what have you. Um, if, I mean, so this is all, uh, most of it, uh, my personal opinion, but I would say that, you know, GNU Linux would look up to HQX and, you know, BSDI and HQX. And in my head, I would see that, you know, the developers looking up to those guys going, oh, I wish we could do awesome things like these Unix environments are doing. And we'll be all, you know, now Linux is the same bug, right? But point being is, you know, I kind of imagine in 1995, when I was still in crib, um, uh, that uh, they were saying these types of things, relying on German software for scenes. And so then the whole issue there. So when you talk about the implications as far as from a, like a national uh, infrastructure focus, we're, and so this, I mean, take the degree of salt, but kind of most all countries are all running on the same stuff, in a sense, if you know what I mean. It's not the same applications, it's not the same platforms, but they're a blend, and there's not that many options, right? 
So when you talk about SCADA, there's open source SCADA, there's you know, 5, 10, 15 proprietary SCADA vendors that you know, have a good lock in the market, and there's nothing much to choose from. So when you do a SCADA talk and you find something impactive, you can't do a talk. So, you know, I hear that happening today. Okay, so um, my superhero, Dave Litchfield. Um, anybody have heard of Dave Litchfield? Just a raise of hand. Okay, uh, so the uh, in pretty much anything from 2002 to 2001 to 2007, almost, I'm going to say almost every, but the majority from what I saw, the majority of Oracle bugs that were uh, found were found by this thing. Uh, so these guys have pioneered a lot of the uh, Oracle SQL injection attacks, uh, the cursor hijacks, a lot of application specific stuff, but also, so application specific defects, but additionally specific defects or issues with you know, hardcore database business. And so, I don't know David personally. Uh, he follows me on uh, Twitter. Um, my guess is David is probably doing something similar to what I'm doing in the sense that you're, you don't want to work with AIX, but you have to because that's what your customers are running, so suddenly you have to be an expert on it and a security expert. And how better to be a security expert than to be me? So, you know, that's kind of where I started. Kind of, it's actually kind of why, um, but actually I'll, I'll say that and then I'll lead into this. Um, so if anybody cares, the way I got sucked into this is, uh, I guess, you know, the, as people seeing the, the concept of you know selling bugs and doing research and all that stuff, I mean, there's money to be made um, if any of you uh, serious security researchers out there and you're sitting on a day. That's a, that's a pitch, but let me know if you need you know, otherwise, because this stuff is uh, very, once again, we're talking about critical infrastructure systems. We're not talking about client side attacks, which could be just as bad, but, you know, the number of less, but the impact could be just as great. Um, so, we're going to cover David's uh, method real quick. Um, so, David Litchfield was able to exploit heap corruption by one specific methodology, and we're going to talk about that. Um, his research was done on AIX 5.3L. Uh, my research was actually done on 6.1 and then backported to 5.3. Um, so, in case David ever sees this talk, it stuff does still work on the 6.1 stuff, uh, which is awesome because uh, they're you know the, it's still 6.1 with I think three service packs or four service packs because so there's still a lot of and I think they're getting ready for 7.1, but you know, there's still a lot of room there. Uh, the more I do this talk, the more 7.1 is coming out. I think. Um, so once again, this method still works. Um, when we're talking about heap corruption, uh, we're so different, once again, I, I'm going to lose part of my audience, but uh, differentiating between the stack and the heap, uh, when you're doing stack overflows, you're, that's, that's pretty basic, right? Uh, but as far as heap exploitation, you're talking about overriding or corrupting memory that is, in essence, an abstract data type. So you have to better understand, I hate this term, the algorithm of how the abstract data type is being used um, to reduce the uh, that's that called the uh, the missing chunks in between uh, reallocation. Whatever it's called. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Hey, look, I'm an expert. Um, but uh, and so this that's when this method's going to be used. So if we have heap corruption and then we try and free something, so if it's in a multi-threaded application, some instances you may not be able to predict malloc versus free. What's going to happen next? So this comes back to the old good tricks of I think Charlie Miller talked about this. Um, I, I call it massaging the memory. Uh, basically, pre-calculating requests you can do. So if it's client-side bug, it's one way of doing it. But So for example, if it's a server uh, client, so like SMP or something, uh, you would actually uh, hope that during the communication process, when you corrupt those bytes, that within uh, the buffer that you're sending, there's something there that you can control. And Technically, we only need 16 bytes plus however big your shellcode is. And so, for those of you not familiar with uh, RISC, a shellcode sucks because it's typically four times as big because it has to be four by one. Um, you know, thank you all those smart guys in the 80s and 90s who my butt now because now I have a very, uh, as far as shellcode goes, I have a very subsection of shellcode I'm able to utilize. Uh, additionally, um, as far as the AX stuff goes, so I'm not real familiar with Core. I'm not, well, I'm familiar with Canvas. Uh, but 
Canvas, from my, from my experience, Canvas and Benchboy, uh, neither one of their AIX shellcode generators or in the shellcode that's generated by these are working on the 6.1 stuff that I tried. Uh, and so that's a whole other topic, but I actually had, doing this research um, for the next minute dollar remark, but I actually had to write my own shellcode that was more compatible with this latest PC, uh, sorry, Power 7 architecture. So this was done in Power 6 and Power 7. Once again, I'm, I'm a young kid, and that's the, the newest technology out there, and that's what I got my hands on. So if you guys have Power 4, Power 3, whatever, Power negative 1, you know, call your grandma, because I can't help you. Um, so, I mentioned if we can overwrite 8 bytes, then, and we can control something, right, uh, we're going to talk about the 16 bytes. Basically, what we're doing is we're making a fake heap frame. So we talked about before, we're overwriting one of the heap frames already, somehow. What we do is we create a, a pseudo heap frame that looks like it should work, but it has special properties. And we point the next pointer that we just overwrote to our fake heap frame. Everybody get that? So for example, um, if you had eight bytes of corruption, you would have two uh, four byte pointers being passed. And those, one of those four byte pointers could point to your environment location. And maybe in your environment, uh, the environment location on your stack, you know, stack that uh, it, uh, because it's static and predictable, predictable location, uh, then you can use that as where uh, you would store your heap frame. And so that's going to be a good example for a local attack, and that's what I've done for my local attacks. A remote attack, once again, like RPC or something like that, you're going to have to put this in there somewhere in the protocol, or, or how I mean, HTTP, obviously, it's easy, right? But it's not easy when you have, you know, 24 bytes total in RPC negotiation, and, you know, you've got to do something off of that. So it's, trust me, I still have a bug I can't exploit because of that. Um, so once again, 16 bytes. Um, this is what the, uh, the fake frame looks like. So the first pointer is actually a PowerPC branch instruction. Uh, the second pointer, I'm sorry, the second four bytes uh, is a knock, uh, only because it gets executed uh, after the branch instruction. Uh, so once again, those that are familiar with PPC, you know about the predictable branching, and you know that when you call to a new location for assembly, it technically executes the next instruction before actually going over the system, thought they were so smart. So, um, anyway. So, third pointer uh, is going to be the pointer to the value we want to overwrite. So, it's going to be the location of a function pointer. It's going to be the location of a return stacks pointer. It's going to be something magical. Um, so whatever is necessary. Oh, yeah. If uh, you guys don't understand, uh, heap overflows or don't work as stack overflows, basically you're given a controllable overwrite. That's it. It's not overwrite a bunch of data. It's just you're able to change your pointer memory, basically. And so instead of overwriting the function pointers on the stack, they just so happen to uh, mangle like an ogre. Uh, the heap exploitation is a little bit more elegant as those of you who follow uh, in the sense that you can only tick you know, typically four bytes or maybe a double four byte overwrite. Uh, so you have to pick a specific bunch of points and you call next. So for example, if it were Windows, then the old trick in the Windows XP, you would use something in PDB, like a PDB lock or unlock or something, because those typically call really quickly. But with AIX, we're talking about cough and XCOF. So you have to do a whole other, you know, uh, piece of research on that file format. And so if you older guys, you're probably going to throw something at me. But to me, the cough format looks similar to the L format. So it made a lot of sense to me when I was looking for offset tables and lookup tables to your function point is overwrite. Um, one, and then the last four bytes uh, is the heap size. Uh, so I talked about the algorithm that looks for a specific size when the size has to match. So your fake heap frame has to have the same size as the overflow you just wrote. So the first four bytes, like I said, is the pointer to where this is. And the next four bytes is the heap size. It doesn't matter, it just has to match the heap size on your fake frame. Otherwise, you can control the little part. Once again, this is what it looks like in memory. 